Coming up, new technology and new moral challenges. These are questions we need to think about before we have the technologies. We have to engage in what I call prophylactic ethics. We have to think about what this means for us. NASA's Paul Root Wolpe talks mind reading, cerebral privacy, health in the space station, and more from the cutting edge of bioethics. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Today's guest has spent his career examining the ethics underlying tomorrow's scientific breakthroughs. As one of the nation's most prominent bioethicists, Paul Root Wolpe encourages scientists to reconsider not only what they can do, but what they should do. Dr. Wolpe is the Asa Griggs Candler Professor of Bioethics and the director of the Center for Ethics at Emory University. He serves as the first senior bioethicist for NASA and the first national bioethics advisor to Planned Parenthood. One of the first things that I'd like to discuss with you is what you tell your students at Emory University. Um, you say that one of the first things you discuss is that science fiction no longer exists. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, when I talk about biotechnology and some of the advances we've made in science recently, I read a lot of science fiction as a kid. I was a, a real fanatic. And I realized how many of those things that were seen as fictional or things that we might someday accomplish are now being done almost routinely. There's very little that we imagined being able to do um, years ago that isn't being attempted. We're synthesizing virtually every organ of the human body. And we have artificial hearts and lungs and kidneys and bladders and artificial skin in development are already here. Um, we have entered an era of brain imaging that will allow us moving along very quickly towards being able to apprehend subjective thoughts. So that's mind reading. Uh, we are recreating animals. We are genetically um, changing animals' very nature, creating hybrid animals. We are interfacing technology and biology so that we now have all kinds of hybrids, whether we're talking about technologies that put me electromechanical controls into brains, whether we're talking about um, taking nerve cells out of animals and using them to control robots. The only possible area of science fiction that we haven't quite gotten to yet is being visited by aliens. And that's why I'm at NASA. I'll let you know <laughs> if that actually, uh, not that I'll be privy to it, but I'm keeping my eyes open. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about your role then as a bioethicist. Where, mm -hmm. where do you come in? Do you set uh, boundaries on where you think sh science should and should not go, or are you raising questions? So there are different kinds of ethicists. I'm a sociologist by training. My PhD is in sociology. Many ethicists are philosophers or theologians. Philosophers and theologians generally believe they have some purchase from which to make ethical decisions, whether it comes from sacred texts or whether it comes from some philosophical um, strategy to reach an ethical conclusion. As a sociologist, I don't actually feel like I have any particularly better purchase from which to make ethical decisions than anyone else has. I just know a lot more about it because I've made it my life's work to study it. And so in general, I raise more questions than I give answers. And when people ask me for my answers, I give them, always careful to say, I'm not sure this answer has any more validity than your answer. It's just I've thought about it a lot. So let me explain to you why the kinds of conclusions I come to I think are valid. Or in some cases, perhaps I don't know what the right answer is. Um, ethics that has simple answers is uninteresting ethics. The question of ethics that's always so difficult is when you have competing values, both of which you think are good values. It's when they clash, speed versus the advantage of, um, of having a new organism that, that might help in some way to create a new drug or whatever it is. It's when you have two fundamental positive values in conflict is really when ethics becomes so challenging. Ethics and genetics have long been closely intertwined in the public eye. But I think many of us don't necessarily think of ethics when we think of how we study the brain. And you argue that we should. In fact, you're one of the founders of what's called neuroethics. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Why is the study of the brain and how we use those studies so ethically contentious? Back when genetics in its modern form was first um, becoming one of the central um, concerns of ethics around the time of the Human Genome Project and before, right before that. 
why did we think ethics was so important? Well, one of the things you heard all the time was my DNA is uniquely me. It is something about my identity, something about who I am. I don't want people to have it. I want there to be genetic privacy. I don't want people to. Well, if you think about it, my DNA isn't uniquely me. I could have, I don't have, but I could have an identical twin brother who has identically the same DNA as I have, but is not me, right? But my brain is uniquely me. What is it that makes us organisms different than other organisms? My memories, my thoughts, my feelings, all of those things that we think of as um, uh, characteristics of our brains. And so we should be much more concerned about our increasing ability to change the function of the brain. So that's one, one side of it, which, which we are be able to do now in ways that really were science fiction just a short time ago. And I'm not sure the public realizes where neurosciences are right now compared to where they were a few years ago. We hear much too much about genetics, in a sense, and not enough about neuroscience. And not only that, but brain scans are sitting in drawers all over the country, and not that many people worry about cerebral privacy. They're much more worried about genetic privacy. And let me tell you, with the increasing sophistication and technological specificity of brain scans, we should start being concerned about brain scans getting out rather than our genetics. Neuroscience, as you mentioned, has for the first time demonstrated that there may be ways to directly access human thought, perhaps even without the thinker's consent. Yeah. So there's talk about the potential for mind reading and something called brain fingerprinting. Yeah. You spent a lot of your time thinking about this. So can you tell us where is the science today on uh, the subject of mind reading? And what are the ethical risks that are associated with it? So mind reading is both much further along than people think and much less of a worry than people think. So how are both of those true? Because in order for us to do anything even remotely like mind reading right now, despite the fears of so many people who write me, you have to put someone in a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine. And outside of fMRI, we can't know what anyone is thinking. And even in fMRI, it's still extraordinarily crude. That being said, what we can now do with an fMRI machine is far more than I thought 10 years ago we would ever be able to do, period. Because I always kept thinking we were going to hit this wall. And yet, every wall we've managed to push through. So what can we do with fMRI right now? So there have been a whole series of experiments that show that our brain function in our brain reflects our thoughts, feelings, and movements. And so if we can understand, and with functional magnetic resonance imaging, we can look at what parts of the brain are working at any particular time, which is all we can actually look at despite what people think. That is, what we look at is which parts of the brain are using oxygen or which parts of the brain are activated at any particular time, and then we extrapolate from that um, what the person might be doing or thinking about. That being said, um, we can do things like look at a brain and tell whether a person is looking at checks or stripes or now landscapes or beings or, any, or a particular scene from a particular movie when we give the person 20 or 30 scenes. We can um, know whether the person is always, very easily, whether they're thinking of an object or a face, because the facial recognition part of the brain is a very large, specific area. But even more, Carnegie Mellon, they did a study where they took random nouns, and they took someone and they asked them, you know, think about broccoli and think about bicycle and think about wrench. And they did 58 nouns and, and watched how a person's brain thought of these 58 nouns. Then they took two other unrelated nouns, and they predicted what the constellation of activation would look like in this particular person when he thought of lampshade. And they were startlingly accurate. So we're getting very close in those kinds of studies to um, actually being able to apprehend words. Are we at the point where they can say, ah, she was thinking of that time she was lying on the Seine drinking Mai Tais with her lover? No. We can't. We're nowhere near that. But we are moving in that direction, and we're moving in that direction pretty rapidly. There are a lot of little examples like that that aren't mind reading, but they give us an ability that we never had before, which is to know what's going on in the human brain absent the person's desire to communicate it to us. So let me say that in a slightly different way. 
throughout all of human history, without a single exception, ever, not even one, for since the time we crawled out of the trees, any information I got about you, I got through your peripheral nervous system. Expression, blushing, heart rate, spoken language, whatever it was, that's all peripheral nervous system activation. I could get no useful information at all from you from your central nervous system, that is from your brain and spinal cord. And the question in front of us is, does that make a difference? Does that pose an ethical challenge? And I think it poses a great ethical challenge. So for example, there's been, there have been a number of studies that have made the argument, and there's refutations of this, so it's not decided, that we actually don't have free will. And these studies have looked at the process of making decisions, and it's a long story, but the bottom line was a very famous experimenter did a study where he thought he discovered that if you ask someone to do something, the brain activates about 400 milliseconds, 400 th thousandths of a second, before the person is consciously aware that they've made the decision. And that person interpreted that as saying, we don't actually make any decisions. Our brain makes the decision, informs our conscious mind what the decision is, and we interpret that as having made a conscious decision. So a big conversation began about whether we actually have free will. What, what some people have said is, well, actually, once we make that decision, so I make the decision I'm going to pick this up, then I can stop and say, no, I'm not going to pick this up. So we don't have free will. We only have free won't. Um, but that is a big argument going on right now. But imagine if some, someone could actually prove that, that we, have no, we make no conscious decisions at all, that our decisions are pre-conscious, inform our conscious mind, and we think of that as having made a conscious decision. What does that say about things like criminal responsibility? Mm -hmm. right? what is, and there are, there's a whole project looking at the issue of jurisprudence and neuroscience. So that's one kind of set of concerns, and that's just one example of that set. On the other side, there's a question of our being able to control, um, uh, our being able to look, for example, into people's brains. Imagine we know, for example, already that um, the government is looking into brain imaging for lie detection. There are now a number of people working on it, believing that um, we will be able to create a much better lie detector using brain imaging. And there's some really convincing evidence that we're already much better at it than any other form of lie detection we have. Still not perfect, still probably not good enough to use in courts, but much better than polygraphy. Uh, well, what if we can perfect that? You know that it's going to be misused, if not by our government, no, our government would never do that. But by, you imagine, you know, di dictatorships and totalitarian governments. Um, and then finally, we're actually now learning how to control the function of the brain. And here, we might actually be able to do it more remotely. And that is through something like transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is simply a very simple coil that sends an electromagnetic pulse into the brain. And what it does, when you hold it over a particular part of the brain, it disrupts function in that part of the brain. And right now, it's being used for a number of different, I think, positive things. But it could theoretically be used, if it could be um, refined, to, for example, imagine that we do discover that there's one discrete part of the brain that is required for deception. This part of the brain is integral to the act of deception. We don't know that that's true yet. There are some theories about this. And then what if you could put a TMS-1 over that part of the brain and disrupt its function? You might actually not create a lie detector, but a deception inhibitor, hmm. right? Is that really what we want? I mean, do we want a world where the government or some other entity can have a really reliable deception detector or even perhaps more problematic a deception inhibitor. These are questions we need to think about before we have the technologies. We have to engage in what I call prophylactic ethics. We have to think about what this means for us and, and then try to make some decisions on how we're going to handle it before they become a reality. As you know, the military has long been a driving force behind some of the most significant technological breakthroughs that we've witnessed in the 20th century, whether it's the atom bomb or the internet. So I'm curious, does the close relationship between science and uh, the military department of defense, does that raise any ethical 
questions for you. You know, it's deeply disturbing, and it's not just disturbing because they're funding it. There is no more problematic and long-reaching ethical challenge in technology we have right now than the drone program itself, the existing unmanned drone program. Um, and that program is only going to build. More and more countries already have unmanned drones. The technology for it will be over-the-counter technology in another 10 years. And what happens when battles can always be fought remotely? What happens when you remove the human risk and the human encounter from battle? You create a very, very different kind of killing. And that in itself is, is a deeply disturbing um, path we're already far down. We have already killed thousands of people in drone strikes. And um, not to mention even just using them for surveillance has ethical challenges. But there is a broader ethical challenge here about the use of technology, which I think is both a military question, is a question around how we interact with each other as human beings as technology takes us further and further away from the human encounter, not just in military settings, but in one-on-one -on -one settings with our friends. And that's not to say these technologies don't have great use, mm -hmm. but they are changing the nature of human interaction. And whenever you do that, you have a deep ethical question that you need to think about. And you need your greatest minds to think about it. It's not for the ethicists to think about this alone. Uh, we all need to think about it, and, we, and our philosophers need to think about it, and our humanists need to think about it, and our scientists need to think about it. We've discussed the ethics of uh, life on Earth, but <laughs> you, of course, are the uh, chief bioethicist at NASA. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit what do you do there, and what is different about ethics in space versus on Earth? I started my career doing medical ethics and then eventually moved into more biotechnology, though I still do a lot of medical ethics. And the issues at NASA are primarily medical ethics issues, but they're different medical ethics issues. In that, when you ask a medical ethics question here about um, care for average people, things like cost, access, you know, our Byzantine and disgraceful uh, reimbursement system in this country, they all almost always pl poverty play into the equation. When you ask a question about how do you medically outfit a craft going to Mars? None of those are issues, right? NASA will have the money it needs to outfit that craft. Now there's a different interesting question that comes in. So let's imagine that we were all the committee whose job it was to decide how to outfit a craft going on what we call a long duration spaceflight beyond Earth orbit, which is the long way of saying going to Mars or the moon. Right now on space station, if there's a medical emergency, the philosophy is stabilize the person, do whatever you can up there, which isn't usually that much, and then get them back to Earth quickly. When you're 8 million miles on your, away on your way to Mars, you can't do that, which means we have to equip a craft with all of the medical necessities that it needs. Now, every ounce you put on a craft, uh, you have to take an ounce off somewhere. Weight is one of the single greatest issues of space transportation. So then you have to start making decisions. Can you put an x-ray machine on there? That's a really heavy piece of, so maybe you only use ultrasound. Um, what about the formulary? Are you really going to put a drug on for every possible thing that someone could get on the way? Or are you going to compromise by saying, well, while these five drugs treat these five different syndromes really well, this one drug treats all five OK, right? So we'll use this drug because it takes weight on. Those kinds of decisions, are we going to have a surgical suite? How are we going to train the astronauts? We want redundancy, so we can't just have one doctor. What if the doctor gets sick? Those kinds of questions become really very interesting ethical <coughs> challenges. There are many ethical challenges on space station right now around medical issues. What about medical privacy? Let's say an astronaut gets sick on space station, and he talks to his doctor, which he can do privately through a secure channel, um, but his sickness might affect the mission. Do the other astronauts have a right to know? HIPAA says no, by the way, which is the uh, Health Care Act that assures privacy. Astronauts have privacy also. There are all those kinds of interesting questions um, around ethics of putting people into space that we're just beginning to, to really think about in a deep way. 
if you had an Al Alzheimer gene, would you want to know, should you know, who should know? The issue of genetic testing has been a difficult one since the day they first released the first genetic tests. There's nothing particularly ethically different in my getting a genetic test and my getting any other kind of test if the information was limited to me. So, for example, imagine that we could tell that you were susceptible to Alzheimer's because we found that you had uh, the ApoE gene, which is an Alzheimer's susceptibility gene, or we had some other test. We looked in your eyes, made you move your eyes, I'm making this up, made you move your eyes back and forth. You said, aha, because of the way he moves his eyes, we see that he's in the class of people that is more susceptible to Alzheimer's. I suspect that if we talked about that second eye test, there aren't that many people would say, that's unethical, you can't do it, how can you tell it? Right? It is because it is a genetic test that we seem to have such problems with it. And that is because we misunderstand the nature of genetics and we think genetics are destiny. With very few exceptions, and there are some exceptions, genetic tests are susceptibility tests. They're not deterministic tests. We can say, you have an increased risk. Which brings up a whole other issue that I've been writing about and thinking about a lot, and I'm going to tell you even though you didn't ask about it, because I think it's so ethically fascinating. Let's take susceptibility to schizophrenia. We have now gotten to the point where we have certain markers, both potentially genetic, but certainly physiological and behavioral, that suggest that any particular individual boy, let's say, let's talk about males, um, at the age of 9, 10, or 11 is probably more likely to develop schizophrenia than another boy. We have certain um, indicators. Let's imagine for a minute that we can prove that this kid has a 10 time greater chance than the average kid of developing schizophrenia. The average risk of developing schizophrenia is just under 1%. So now this kid has a 9% chance. What do we do with that information? His chance is 10 times greater than the average kid. He still has a 91% chance of not getting schizophrenia. Right? Do we have some ethical obligation to act on that knowledge, even though the odds are still 10 to 1 that he's not going to get it? Um, and, what, and let's say my risk for colon cancer because of genetic tests was you know, 30% and yours was 45%. Are, is that a meaningful? distinction. What we are doing is we're turning medicine into a risk assessment system. And we're beginning to get more and more information about what our risks are, but we don't know what to do with it. First of all, because these, there's ranges. So we say this test shows that you have from a 30 to a 50 percent. Sometimes it's even greater. And second of all, because human beings are extremely bad risk assessors. There isn't good language to talk about risk. We don't even know how to speak about it, never mind how to assess it. And then we try to create analogies. You have the risk of colon cancer is kind of like your risk of getting hit by, you know, uh, a car. Does that, is that more helpful? So we don't even know how to talk about this. So the issue of diagnostic tests and the kind of information they give us and things like susceptibility and risk is one of the greatest challenges, I think, in all of medicine right now. You mentioned briefly about brain fingerprinting. Mm. Could you elaborate a little bit about that and exactly what might be some of the legal implications in its advancement? So brain fingerprinting doesn't mean what it sounds like it means. Brain fingerprinting is actually a patented process that a man named Lawrence Farwell created. And what brain fingerprinting is, I'm not going to do it justice in this explanation, but we don't have time. So basically, it's this. It uses EEG, not brain imaging. If I were to give you all a set of pictures of random female faces, and I stuck in there a face of your mother, and you're going through and you've never seen any of these faces, and all of a sudden you come upon the face of your mother, your brain goes, I know that face. And there's this recognition reaction that your brain has that you don't have control over. If we had you hooked up to an EEG, you would see a particular spike of a particular wavelength when that happens, right? The P300, it's called. And what Farwell has argued is brain fingerprinting is called a kind of lie detection, but it's actually not. It's something else. So I say, I didn't kill her. Not only did I kill her, I was never in her apartment. So what if we could take 20 apartments and put them in a pile and have you on EEG and you start looking through it and then when you hit her apartment your P300 spikes I can say well your brain's telling me that you recognize this 
Now, you might recognize it from a picture in the paper. Who knows? And so what Farwell was saying was it's a useful tool, and he has patented a process he calls brain fingerprinting in order to do that. That doesn't do it justice, but it explains it enough to say what's happened. There are some real serious problems with it on a number of different levels. Uh, because it's proprietary, he won't allow independent scientists to test his particular way of doing it, that he's been trying very hard for a long time to get into the courtroom. Um, he has succeeded in one case. Um, I think it is very premature. I think one of the things that's happening, one of the things that's happening throughout neuroscience right now is premature use of these technologies for a whole host of things, a lot of them legal, including brain imaging for lie detection. So um, I have been an advocate, very strong advocate of the idea that these things are not ready yet to be used in out the, outside the clinic, that we need a very high bar for validation and reliability testing, and um, that it is a misuse of science to be doing these things out in the public realm. Uh, there are two commercial companies right now doing brain imaging for lie detection. There's Larry Farwell doing his brain fingerprinting. I'm, I'm very worried about these um, technologies. Thank you so much for being sure. with us. Yeah. For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.